Hey, it's Jag. Well, the high watt's been uh, completed for a couple of weeks already. Um, I've been playing around with it over in the studio, getting to know the ins and outs a bit. Um, as I said in uh, one of my last videos, uh, there are a few, uh, two minor issues with it. Um, it uh, the overdrive section self-oscillates. It, it gets a little bit whistly. And um, there was some hiss with the um, effects loop that I need to resolve. So um, today I'm going to uh, work on the uh, self-oscillation. So stick around. We're going to be doing a little bit of playing with the overdrive section. So I've been doing some research and I found a really good place to do research. It's called a library. Do you know that in the United States, they have a library of Congress. You can't trust politicians. And so my research on marshmallows is, is almost complete. Um, when you were away, I did an unboxing and I, I said some things about um, marshmallows in the 1800s. The most recent information I have on marshmallows is from the last century, the, the 20th century. In 1927, the Girl Scouts invented s'mores. Do you know what s'mores are? That's when you, you put marshmallows that you roast over a fire on a graham cracker with chocolate. I bet they're yummy. So uh, uh, then a little later in 1948, Marshmallow construction got really high tech. They invented a process called extrusion, and that's what makes marshmallows round and pillowy like that. So that was really smart. They entered the high tech age at that time. Sounds like you've been on a fool's errand. I'm no fool, and my name's not Serend. Well, welcome back to the Triwatt build. So I've had a couple of weeks to play with this now, and I've come up with um, two issues that I need to deal with. Neither one is very major. Uh, today I'm going to deal with the one that um, uh, is the most pressing to me, and that is the, um, the self-oscillation or feedback. Uh, if I have the master volume up full, and uh, both the normal and bright channel volumes up full, and I engage the um, overdrive and turn it up full, um, the amp will start to oscillate or ring feedback um, by itself. That's called self-oscillation. Uh, that's with nothing plugged into the, to the input at all. Um, it's not a massive issue for me. I would never run with everything uh, on 10. Uh, yes, I would run with the master volume on 10 and might come close to having both of the preamp volumes, bright and normal, on, on 10. Um, but if I were engaging the overdrive, I would not go with near the amount of gain that that could give me on 10. Um, generally, in my current playing around with the amp, um, I'm running um, master volume 10, uh, presence treble, um, bass, and uh, middle are all sort of in between about 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. Um, and uh, uh, the master or the um, preamp volumes, bright and uh, normal, I usually run at about, uh, I guess that would be about uh, 4 o'clock or, you know, uh, not quite, not quite full up. Um, so when I engage the overdrive, I'm, I'm keeping the overdrive pretty low. Although I have also found that uh, if I set the uh, amp, so without the normal or without the overdrive in, it's uh, clean or on the edge of breakup. And then I dial up the, uh, the uh, drive control to get some crunch when I engage that without boosting it too much. Um, I will go through 
um, the features, do the features uh, a review at some point and show you how all of that works. But for today, like I say, I'm concentrating on uh, this ringing. Um, I would never uh, run the whole lamp with everything on 10, so it's kind of moot to get rid of the ringing. But there's two reasons I want to do, three reasons I want to do that. One is uh, as much as I say I can live with it, it bugs me that that happens. Um, and uh, the other reason is if I were to ever uh, loan this to somebody else or have somebody else play, I know the first thing everybody does is crank all those things full and they go, hey, it feeds back, you know. So in terms of optics, that doesn't look good. Um, the other thing is... Um, running it if I were ever to run it like that that's just way more gain than I would ever ever use uh, you, you basically get into blocking distortion territory it sounds ugly um, you know so I would never run that full so um, I have already gone through the amp um, and done everything I can with lead dress the main things to look at are all of the leads feeding uh, feeding V2 A and B, but mostly B. Our input is coming uh, off of these are those two 470k uh, mixing resistors. It's looking a little close there. Uh, okay, so our input to uh, to V2 in general, the switch and everything, is this coax coming here. These are those two 470k ohm. Uh, mixing resistors coming from the uh, from V uh, V1, uh, so that's the input to V2, uh, kind of both sides depending how you have things switched for the overdrive. So this coax cable, uh, you need to look at how it's running in relation to all the other wires, and you need to get it away from the from any other wires where it could inject its signal and cause a feedback uh, loop. And same thing with this is uh, the coax uh, for the overdrive control itself. So this is actually controlling how much overdrive or how much level you're putting into that overdrive circuit. And that's uh, this coax lead here. Um, so these were under the board. Um, I had run this, this one here is for the effects loop. I had run that over the board just because of the way everything went together. Um, but I had run these ones under the board um, just because it looked neater and I thought I might have some trouble there. So I had to pull these ones out from under the board and then bring them up and over. You also make them as short as you can. Uh, you want to keep as high above the board as you reasonably can with these so that they're not as short as you could technically make them if you were taking them right down on the board or, or underneath the board even. But uh, you don't want to get sort of close to all the other components, particularly here. This is the tone stack. So this uh, is a later stage, but we could have been having some issues there. Uh, so I've kept this wire as short as I could. Um, the one going to the relay board, I shortened it uh, pretty much as much as I could. I could have brought it straight across here. That would have brought it closer to this heater wire. It also wouldn't have changed the length very much. And in, in moving it around, it actually, when I was moving these wires, the, the, the feedback, the, the oscillation was greatly reduced by moving this wire um, more over this way. So I, I left it long like that so that it or a little bit longer like that because that seemed to be the best spot. So this wire in particular had been going underneath the effects module board and down on the bottom of the, the chassis, or I guess that's the top technically, and then underneath and it was running directly straight across over to here and then over and up. I took this out from under there, ran it up over here. Uh, and around through here and that helped a lot. I'm going to probably do something to get that to stay a little bit more over here. It keeps wanting to wander back over by this uh, by this heater wire. I, I do have a live amp right now. I'm aware of that. That's why I'm using a plastic probe. Um, so I will probably just uh, do something to keep this a little farther over there. But this was the extent of what I did with the uh, the lead dress to deal with my issues. Uh, this is the power 
uh, line going to power the effects board. I had pushed it out of the way when I was working on these down here. I want that standing up and, and, and over here more. Uh, we got these heater wires out of the way. I suppose there's some potential for some issue with the effects loop here. Uh, in my testing, I, I couldn't do anything once I got this here to make the oscillation any better or worse with controls, uh, with the send and receive of the effects loop, etc. So I think we're good with this here. Uh, now what we're going to do is uh, start making some actual changes to the circuit. So if you look at my screen recording here, uh, here is basically um, the, the section of the schematic that concerns us, the inputs, um, the, uh, the brilliant and normal um, first gain stage. I'm not messing with those at all. The, uh, the mixing stage uh, where everything uh, comes out from the brilliant and uh, normal uh, channels and is mixed in uh, to the signal flow going on through to the rest of the amp. So that's this section here. Um, I, or sorry, not this section, that's this section here. Um, I have messed around with that a little bit, but it's not my favorite place to mess with it. Uh, when I get over to the amp, um, I will show you some examples of what I've done and, and why um, I don't want to mess with that too much. And as you just saw, I got a little confused not confused. This always gets me when you look at this. If you look at the schematic here, and I think it gets a lot of people, your inputs come in, uh, your brilliant comes into this side of V1, and normal comes into this side of, of V1, or V1A and V1B. And then they go out, the signal goes out through their plates and to their respective volume controls. Then they are mixed through these 470K mixing resistors, and then they are one signal uh, throughout uh, the rest of the amp. That signal comes out and you look at it and you see this tube here and you think, oh, it's just going straight into that tube and then on to the rest of the amp. Um, that's not actually what's really happening here. Um, this is actually the overdrive section. So your signal does not necessarily come out and go directly um, into um, V2B here, uh, you can see that that's uh, uh, pin 7 uh, or the grid of V2B. Uh, your signal is going there, but if you follow this through its plate to the output through its uh, coupling cap and then the overdrive volume, etc., you see that when the overdrive is not engaged, this output does not go anywhere. You can see that. Maybe I'll describe this and it'll make more sense. When the overdrive is not engaged, your signal comes out here, um, goes through to the overdrive pull switch, it continues on uh, to the rest of the amp. So this is V2A, the grid of V2A, or what you would consider right now your second gain stage. So if I thought that this amp was a little too gainy without the, the uh, overdrive engaged, um, this would be where I would look first to try and reduce some of the gain on the non-overdrive setting. Um, you can reduce gain on your input stages, but there's really not a lot of point. Um, it just kind of makes the, to me, it makes it sound a little too anemic. The signal is pretty weak coming in here, and these just basically, uh, your first input stage just conditions that signal so the rest of the amp can work with it. So here, at the second gain stage, uh, it's the second gain stage when we're not running overdriven, is the, the first prime candidate for reducing your gain or the amount of overdrive. I'm not going to uh, mess with this stage, at least not permanently. I am going to do some changes to just show you uh, what happens when you change it. Um, you can change your gain here by either um, changing, raising, or lowering the plate load resistor or raising or lowering the cathode resistor. Uh, I really mess with the plate load resistor. Um, I won't really go into why right now, but usually I leave the plate load resistors the way they are. But I do tend to work with the cathode resistor. Um, whether I want more gain, less gain, uh, whatever. You can even put a, a bypass cap on it to, to increase gain 
We're not doing that today, so I won't talk about that today. Strictly what I am talking about is changing R14, this 1K resistor. On the cathode of a 12AX7, um, you can run uh, a range of resistors to change the gain of uh, this triode. Uh, basically, uh, from 820 ohms all the way up to 50K ohms if you want. Um, 50K ohms, I would never go that high. The highest I would probably go here would be, um, would be about 10K. Uh, conversely, um, your gain increases if you go um, smaller here. Uh, like I say, down to about 820 ohms. I would not go lower than that. The tube needs to have some resistance there for it to operate properly. Um, and 820 is about as, as much gain as you're going to push out of that tube or as much increase from input to output as you will get. I rarely go 820 there. I actually rarely go as low as 1K. Um, standard kind of vendor value for that is 1.5k and that's usually what I go uh, with on the cathode. Um, this amp, the way it's built right now and the way it sounds, I, I love it just the way it is. So like I say, I'm not really going to change anything about this section of the circuit. Uh, not permanently anyway, but I'm going to show you what happens when you change this resistor. So there's a 1k in there right now. I'll do some sound samples of that. Uh, then I will actually go to a 2.2K, which is the next most uh, common uh, value when you're trying to reduce the amount of gain. And I'll show you what that does to the sound. And then I'll go all the way up to a 10K and show you what that does to the sound. I would never really go higher than a 2.2K generally uh, resistor here. Um, that is because once you start reducing the gain beyond that, it starts to... Um, it starts to sound kind of spitty or harsh or uh, I just don't like the way that the crunch is. If I were going totally clean, no crunch at all, uh, then I might do that. Um, but it just, to me, it, the sound just, the overdrive starts to get ratty <laughs> when you reduce it that much. And this is sort of Jag's uh, cooking by smell method of uh, modifying or tweaking an amp. Um, I don't go into the theory or the, you know, load lines and whatnot. I, I, I go by, at this point, what my ear has told me over years of working uh, with amps. And going beyond 2.2K here just makes the overdrive sound kind of ratty. It still sounds fine, clean, um, but I just prefer the sound of, uh, uh, of it with a, anywhere between a, a 1K and a 1.5K on the second gain stage. But this is a candidate for reducing the gain. Um, if I were having ringing problems with the overdrive not engaged and the lead dress was all fine, um, this would be a place I would be looking to see what might happen if I reduce the gain. Um, you could also do it in the recovery after the tone stack, um, but this would be the first place that I would look, and this is what we're talking about today. I'll show you on the layout exactly what I'm talking about changing. So here is that 1K resistor. Uh, for V2A, the cathode resistor for T V2A. Um, you can see that um, it grounds on this side. It, uh, it is connected to this ground bus. And then here it goes to this grounding lug for the preamp section. On this side, it connects to pin 3 of V2, which is the cathode of V2A. So I'm going to change this resistor uh, from the stock 1K I'm going to try 2.2K in there and then show you how that changes the sound without the overdrive engaged. Um, and maybe I'll show you with the overdrive engaged too. Uh, I'll show you at first with a 1K in here. Then I'll put a 2.2K in there and show you how that changes the uh, gain in the overdrive. And then I'll go all the way to a 10K and show you why uh, show you what that does. Um, you'll also see why this is not really the place I want to change the gain so I can deal with the overdrive ringing. I'm not having any problems when the overdrive is not engaged, so I really don't feel a need to change any part of this circuit. I'm just showing you that for interest. I'll cut away now to the to the amp. I'll, uh, I'll substitute in those resistors. I'll start with the 1K, then I'll go to a 2.2K, then to a 10K, and I'll show you how that affects 
um, the sound, the tone, uh, the overdrive, how clean or dirty it is. Um, and, and, and you'll probably see why uh, I'm going to stick with the 1K here. Okay, so um, the amp is here in its stock form, uh, the way it was built. Um, we're going to be messing with the cathode resistor on V1, uh, V2A. Um, right now it's the stock value of 1K. Um, I'm going to leave it there ultimately. I like the sound of this channel the way it is. Um, but I just wanted to demonstrate what uh, effect changing that cathode resistor has. So I'm going to go uh, from the 1K which is in right now, I'll do a 2.2K and then I'll install a 10K and just show you what changes. Uh, so master volume full, normal volume full, bright volume full and we'll mess with the overdrive. Right now the over overdrive is not engaged and here's the stock sound of this channel. I quite like this as a crunch sound. It's a little more gain than I would uh, use uh, normally uh, but for uh, the demonstration and, and, and looking for rings, I want to encourage that to happen. So I've got a little more gain than I would normally have. Here's the sound of it without the overdrive in. Uh, so nice, you know, I would mess with those tones a bit uh, if I were uh, recording something or, you know, playing, but this is just to demonstrate this, so I'm not too worried about the tone. Let's engage the overdrive. It's turned off right now. Oh, before I do that, uh, no rings. I can let go of the guitar. The volume is up full. Um, we have no issues with ringing. Um, when I switch to the neck, uh, it starts to whistle, um, but... Uh, hopefully that will be dealt with as things go on here. Um, also, I'm sitting right in front of the amp. Uh, I'm sure, well, let's try it. Um, volume up full. If I go a little farther away from the amp and, and turn away, because I would never sit right in front of the amp like that when I was playing anyway. Let's see what happens on the neck. Okay, so we're, we're good. No feedback until I come up really close to the amp, which is the way every amp is. So there, you know, I get about uh, two feet away from it, facing it directly, and we start to get some rain. I'm sure if I turned, yeah. So, you know, I can get right up to eight inches turned at, a, at an angle to the amp there. So I'm not worried about that. That's, uh, like I say, I'd never get that close to this amp uh, when I was playing. Uh, and I would never have these uh, controls all up full like this. So, we'll engage the overdrive. I'll leave the guitar volume down for right now. And uh, the overdrive is right off. With the guitar volume down, let's see if we get self-oscillation. Um, I was in my testing before. So right now I've got the overdrive halfway up. Yeah, it's going to come on here. So I've got the overdrive j at 9 o'clock, just after 9 o'clock. Or sorry, that would be 3 o'clock just after three o'clock or almost full up it starts to ring um, with with the volumes and everything off so it's self oscillating for sure uh, if i unplug the guitar jack it's same thing which is what we would expect so let's just see um how much uh how high we can get that overdrive with the volume turned up. So I'm on the, the bridge pickup, the overdrive volume is down all the way right now. I'm going to turn it till it starts to ring. So there again we're at about, what would that be, 2 o'clock. It's starting to whistle at 2 o'clock. Uh, let's see how much gain that is. And, and again, if I move farther from the amp, I can I probably won't have that issue. So now I'm about three feet from the amp at an angle to it. The guitar volume is full up. Let's see how high I can get this overdrive. There. It's at about uh, uh, two o'clock. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just starting to ring there. If I turn farther away, it's, it's still just on the verge. Um, 
I like that amount of gain, but it is starting to get a little bit hairy uh, there. I would use that for a solo, not for a rhythm if I used it. So we can get the overdrive a little over halfway with everything else full up. Uh, and um, it just starts to whistle there. So uh, let's try the 2K and the 10K and see what happens there. And uh, after that, we'll get on to um, playing with the gain levels in the overdrive circuit itself, uh, which is where uh, I'm going to address this anyway. This part is just for demonstration. So stand by, we will do that, and uh, I'll be back with the 2.2K. All right, so find a 2.2K right there. So I'm just uh, tack soldering this ground of this coax uh, to the ground bus wire here for now so I don't have to keep trying to get it out of my way while I'm changing these resistors. Now I have the 2.2K two in there. We'll fire up the amp and we'll see what that does for our gain. Again, uh, I'm not going to change any of the settings uh, when the overdrive is disengaged. Um, so all of these comparisons, the 1K, the 2.2K, the 10K, um, the, when we're with the overdrive disengaged, everything is set the same on the amp. So you can hear what the difference in the gain levels is. Okay, so here uh, is with the 2.2K, the overdrive is disengaged, as I said, and you can see already um, the gain has come down a bit. It's still in a pretty nice range for um, uh, for kind of a, a rhythm guitar part. Um, cleans up pretty nice, you know. Should tune. Um, Oh, but right, right, right away there, um, we've got some ring, and we haven't even um, we haven't even engaged the overdrive. So on the neck pickup, I get some ring just when I get to full. Uh, um, on the uh, bridge pickup, uh, no ringing. Uh, so, so we're right at the edge of of ring, even with the overdrive disengaged. I am going to engage the overdrive. The overdrive's halfway up. Let's see what happens. Okay, feedback right away. Turn the guitar volume down. No, no ringing, no feedback. I can turn the overdrive all the way up. We're fine. Uh, let's turn the overdrive all the way off. I'll turn the guitar volume up. Let's see how far we can go before we start getting some oscillation here. Okay, when I get to uh, what would that be? About 11 o'clock, not quite halfway full, I start getting some ringing, just right here. Okay, so that's about 11 o'clock on the overdrive. If I let go of the, the strings, it'll start whistling for sure. So let's see what kind of gain we've got there. That's a nice gain. Um, that would be a level of gain I probably would use. Uh, again, I'd change the tone a bit, but um, that's not what we're doing here. So, uh, that's the 2.2K. I'll put the 10K in and then we'll see how that sounds. So, now I've put that 10K resistor on the cathode of V2A. Um, you can see it right here. Um, and you will know when I play this, <clears throat> that the level of gain, the level of crunch, overdrive, is quite a bit less, uh, especially with the overdrive itself disengaged. So again, as I say, this um, is just affecting uh, V2A, which is always in circuit. It's the second gain stage 
when the overdrive is disengaged and it's the third when we engage the overdrive. So right now I haven't changed any of the tone controls. They're going to stay the same through this whole, uh, whole video. What we'll be changing is uh, basically just the overdrive uh, level. Normal volume is on full, bright volume is on full, master volume is on full, and then the overdrive, um, I'm kind of leaving it halfway and then we see how high we, we can sneak it before we get ringing. So here's the sound uh, of, the, um, uh, of the amp without the overdrive engaged with that 10k cathode resistor on B2A. So you can see quite quite a bit um, uh, quite a bit less gain. Um, it's not uh, it's not sort of enough less that it would be what I would use as a clean sound. Of course, these volumes are all on ten. Uh, I probably wouldn't run that way anyway. Um, but for this demonstration, we're we're looking for getting rid of that ring. Uh, so this isn't really about the, the, the tone or crunch that I'm, I'm getting in terms of usability. But it is more gain than I would use for a clean sound and less than I would use for a crunch uh, rhythm uh, sound. Let's engage the overdrive. It's halfway up. And let's see how that, uh, what that does for it. So right away, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a nice amount of gain. It's a good crunch rhythm sound. Um, <laughs> It's um, not quite as round, um, I think, as when that cathode resistor is, uh, is 1K uh, or even 2K. Um, this is a really extreme change of the cathode resistor. Um, and as I said at the top of this video, this is not uh, where I want to deal with my gain issues anyway. I just wanted to show you uh, what the difference would be uh, between 1K, 2.2K, and then an extreme 10k in here. So I'm going to put that 1k back in, get this amp back to stock, and then we'll start uh, working on the um, cathode resistor on V2B. This is where I think I will be adjusting the gain uh, to tailor the, the sound of this amp to my uh, tastes. Oh, one thing I forgot to do. Uh, now with the um, overdrive disengaged, um, everything else is up, up full. Um, I have no ring. You can, you can hear, there's no ring, fine, I take my hands off and there's nothing. I engage the overdrive, which is at about halfway, same thing, it's, it's happy there. But you'll note, I'll turn up the overdrive um, and uh, I'll stop when it starts to ring. Uh, I'm going to, uh, first of all, with the guitar volume down, I can take the overdrive all the way up, no ringing. Uh, but let's turn the guitar volume up full as well. And we'll bring this up just till it starts to ring. So right there, it's just starting to ring. That's at about um, uh, one o'clock on the overdrive. So uh, still usable gain there. You know, it's not not too much. But that's as high as I could get that without it ringing when I have the volume up. Uh, yes, I'm sitting close to the amp here, so if I turned away or, or went a few feet away, that probably wouldn't ring either. Um, so uh, that's where we're at. Uh, so we're done messing with uh, the cathode resistor on v V2A. I'm going to set it back to stock and then we'll get to the overdrive circuit. <laughs> 